Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ken Rogers. I'm an associate professor at York University at AMPD. I'm also the director of uh, the Motion Media Space, Motion Media Studio at Cinespace, and a co-director of the AM&E Arts, Media, and Entertainment Management Program at the Schulich School of Business. I want to welcome you tonight and also recognize that York University recognizes that many Indigenous nations have a long-standing relationship with the territories on which York University campuses um, are um, located um, uh, that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and it is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And we are also aware that many of you join us from other traditional territories outside the GTA, and we invite you to acknowledge your presence on those territories as well. So I want to welcome uh, my class. Um, this is one of our last classes, and I think it will undoubtedly be one of our best. I'm very excited to have our guests, so it's a privilege uh, to end this way for my students. I just wanted to have a brief note our class, since we won't be meeting today, um, check the website tomorrow morning. There's some updates about um, final presentation schedule. Um, there's going to be some modifications and adaptations there that will benefit you and give us all a little bit more time to prepare those final presentations. So just a note to the class. Um, but I also want to welcome everybody who's joining us from uh, uh, other part of the what we're going to call the the extended Diamet uh, Extra community uh, from different schools, universities, and from the Diamet X Steering Committee. Welcome all of you for this, um, what is I know going to be a very important conversation and a timely one leading into all of the important discussions around cultural policy uh, and the bill and the online streaming act, Bill C-11, that's going to be ongoing this year and really taking up, um, picking up this fall. Uh, so this is a great introduction to those issues. In fact, I noted just recently that just last week, Mayor Tory announced that Toronto's film industry announced a record shattering something like 2.88 billion in direct production spend just in the GTA alone. That's not even including all of Ontario. So um, we are still in, in the midst of a tremendous boom. The screen industry is also, uh, while we're in this boom period, we're also figuring out how we're going to regulate and create um, uh, various opportunities to subsidize this important industry for Canada. And tonight our, our guests are experts in that field where else to help us guide and, um, and lay out some of the problems before us. So I'm going to turn it over now um, to the executive director of DMNX, um, Carolyn Sumner. She's also a principal in the DMN Extra Steering Committee and a DMN Extra um, uh, core member. And she's also a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto Faculty of Music. So uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Caroline uh, for tonight's program. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening and for participating in our event. We're really happy to have you guys here. Um, so really, before we get started, I'd just like to give you a quick overview of what DM and Extra is and who we are and our goals. Some of you may have already participated in a DM and Extra event in the past or DM and X specifically, um, but this you know, should just act as a quick refresher if uh, you already know who we are or you don't know who we are. So essentially a history of DM and Extra really can't begin without a brief overview of the annual conference, Digital Media at the Crossroads, DM and X. DMX connects industry members, policymakers, academics in a two-day event highlighting the state of the entertainment industries in Canada through panel discussions. As this event has grown, graduate students researching and working in this area have increasingly looked to have a voice at this important table. While there have been more ways for graduate students to participate in the conference itself, most students crave more discussion um, and increasing opportunities for networking. And with this in mind, this is where DM Extra was really born. Uh, as an annual collaborative event sponsored by DM at X, DM at Extra involves, usually involves an afternoon of workshops and roundtable based discussions among a group of uh, graduate students working in all areas of the entertainment industries. So our most recent DM at Extra event would have been this past fall in October. 
uh, at the 2022 DM at X conference, we launched our Discord channel entitled Policy is Power, which we invite all of you to join. Uh, we would really, really like you to join. With the growth in online participation and the opportunities this affords, Diem and Extra is virtual and nationwide for the very first time. And it's wonderful to have input from all parts of this land that we currently call Canada. And with our Discord channel, that acts as the ideal outlet for the exchange of ideas, resources, and all things Canadian con content and policy related. This event, tonight's event, is a part of our broader initiative to create more opportunities for students to connect with each other and industry professionals while also learning about crucial and relevant cultural policy issues and events. Today's event will be recorded, as Jessica mentioned, as part of a lecture series for students and faculty members alike to access for learning and research purposes, and we hope that this will be the first among many lectures that we host. So with that in mind, I'm going to stop talking, <laughs> and I, will, uh, I would like to now welcome our presenters. So this presentation will be first led by Doug Barrett, who is an adjunct professor of the Arts and Media and Entertainment Entertainment MBA program of the Schulich School of Music and former board chair of the Canadian Television Fund. And Aaron Finley, who's a partner of Stone, Hay, Cafazo, Dombrowski, and Richmond, and former chief legal officer to the Canadian Media Producers Association. Uh, so just quickly, this presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A. We just kindly ask that you type out any questions you may have in the chat, and I will just uh, essentially, uh, you know, read out your questions out loud for our presenters. It'll just be easy, easier for us to manage. And one final thing, seeing as this is a student event, um, we are going to prioritize student questions. So just please keep that in mind if you're not a student. Uh, and I believe that's it. So I'm just going to pass the mic along. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, we want to look at something that we think is rather new and radical about the ongoing debate um, to develop a, a new broadcasting slash online policy for Canada in the new legislation. Um, we call it in the weeds. You often hear of um, people saying, let's not get into the weeds. It's too much detail. Let's deal with the bigger principles. And we think sometimes it's important to get in the weeds and this is a topic uh, on which it's um, necessary. Let's go to the, the first slide. So um, we've, we, we, we talk about uh, the, in the online streaming act, we talk about the importance of having all sectors of the broadcasting system make a contribution to Canadian programming but we don't often spend much time talking about what that actually means, what a Canadian program is. That's what tonight's about. There's been remarkably little change in the system of thinking about what a Canadian program is for decades. Um, and th there's really kind of been one set of rules, but surprisingly, there's a bunch of different ways of looking at these rules, different ways of interpreting them, and different bodies administering them with different aspects focused in different, and we're gonna unpack all of that tonight. Um, and all of that is coming under review for two reasons. One is that the draft bill currently before the House of Commons says that they specifically want the CRTC to look at this issue and they ask a series of questions ab about um, what a future definition of Canadian content should be. We'll discuss all that. Um, the second thing is that once the bill is passed, the government is going to issue a, a direction, a policy direction to the CRTC. Um, and uh, while we haven't seen this document yet, we did see a draft that was attached to the previous iteration, Bill C-10, and it specifically asked the CRTC to look into this issue. Uh, and the issue has profound impacts, not only on the content of the shows you see, but on the professional lives of the folks who work on these shows, because a lot of them, uh, the aspects of Canadian content are, are factors of, of course, who's providing the services and what they do and so on. So let's move along to the next, uh, 
Now, why do we care about Canadian content? And why do we have this system of tax credits, subsidies, and regulatory obligations that have been built up over the last, uh, actually, four or five decades? Um, I think the main reason has been from the beginning um, that we're right beside the United States with their content factories and the ability to spend extraordinarily high amounts of money on budgets for, for their programming. Um, but our market is not large enough to, to create an advert, well, at, until now, advertising base that would support the production costs of those programs. This actually is true with most other countries in the world. Um, throughout Europe and the Middle and Far East, um, countries have systems that support uh, the production and creation of domestic programming. And so, uh, of course, the, um, uh, they have their own systems to, to drive these for almost exactly the same reason as we do. Um, Canadians over and over again uh, give two messages. One is they don't want to miss out on anything that the world has to offer. And by the world, it pretty much always means the United States. So we want an open border. We want to be able to see and choose uh, the programs that we want. And we certainly don't want anybody telling us that we can't get access to programs. But the second message has always been that we want to make sure there's a Canadian presence in that mix. So the regulatory dynamic has always been to find this balance between a blend of having a Canadian presence and Canadian programming that one can watch when one wants to watch it, along with the best the world has to offer and lots of it. And that dynamic that I've just mentioned has driven, I would say, the bulk of the regulatory decisions made by the CRTC, the, our regulatory body, um, over the past decades. So when I think about this question, why do we care about Canadian content, the practical on the ground realities absolutely matter. Those often drive up to policy considerations, right? So I, I sort of break it down into four different policy considerations, and I'm sure there's many more, but this is how I always think about Canadian content and why it's important and why we care about it. Our cultural policy wants Canadian stories. We want to make sure that there's a Canadian identity, that we're reflecting um, Canadian stories, Canadian identity, the multicultural nation that we have, that um, we're able to tell our own stories and that we're able to sell those uh, domestically and make them available to Canadian audiences, but also sell them around the world industrial policy, at least how I think about it, is about jobs. We want jobs for Canadians and how do we foster a domestic market that employs Canadians. Um, from an economic policy, we want a GDP lift. So you'll often see, um, you know, Ken mentioned it earlier tonight in terms of the contribution that uh, film and television production has made to Toronto um, and, and sort of the GDP lift across the country. What does, what do, does Canadian content and the domestic market do for GDP? And as well, competition policy. We don't talk about this often in terms of competition policy, but what it's really about is a diversity of voices in the system. And unfortunately, to date, it hasn't really meant diversity in the way we think of diversity today. What it does mean is that those who have control of the eyeballs or control of access to audiences, at least in the legacy system, that those who control the eyeballs do not also make all of the decisions about the programming that goes into the system. So some of the regulatory obligations and the reasons we care about Canadian content has to do with that competition policy, separating out um, the, the control of the eyeballs, that sounds kind of bizarre the way I'm phrasing it, but access to audiences and the content that is being shown. So if one person in Toronto is making all of the programming decisions and gets to control who sees it, um, we're going to have a very, very niche, narrow um, uh, amount of programming or genres of programming or type of programming. Um, and that is not what's best for this country. So that's what I think of when I, I think about competition policy and why CanCon matters. 
So when, again, when I look at Canadian content, why do we care? I always try to frame it in those four different policy objectives. And I think what we often see when we get into these debates is you'll see different stakeholders or different people only thinking about one or two of these four and it, it limits the discussion, right? And it makes for a very confusing discussion because we forget about why, why we care about Canadian content across the board. We have to think about cultural objectives, industrial objectives, jobs, economic and competition. So then you're gonna see from Doug and I tonight, we're gonna to ask a lot of questions and give you almost no answers. That's intentional. Um, we do wanna hear from you um, answers to some of these questions. So the big one, do Canadian programs even still matter in a globalized world? Um, or I think more accurately, does support for Canadian programs still matter? I think every, every Canadian would say, yes, of course, Canadian programs still matter. But why does that mean we have to have the subsidies and the tax credits and the funding that we have? Um, hasn't the market worked this out already or can't the market work this out? Um, do we actually need government support to meet these policy goals? And how much regulation is too much? You're going to see and hear, and you already have, a real swing, right, from a completely laissez-faire, hands-off regulatory approach to um, a, a much more regulated um, market and, and many more rules to support Canadian programming, which is a little bit more what we're used to in the legacy system. Other questions, how do we support the partnerships that we've already made with global production community without giving up our ability to tell our own stories? There's a lot of um, producers, broadcasters who have made good connections with these global production partners. Um, and when we say the global production community, we mean the streamers, but there's many others that are involved too. So how do we balance that out and how do we not upset the partnerships that we've worked so hard to build? And if we decide we still want Canadian programs in the mix, um, what does the support for that look like? But also, how do we decide what Canadian means? And this is really going to get at the heart of, of what we're talking about tonight. Um, I did want to say our focus tonight is going to be on audiovisual and um, the impact of Canadian programs and how it works in the audiovisual sector. These policy considerations and a lot of the questions apply equally to music and other cultural industries, but Doug and I are going to focus in on, on AV. More oh. questions? Oh, More questions go. for me. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, these are the big, the big questions. So when we get into the weeds of what a Canadian program is, these are some of the questions that we'll be looking at. To be a Canadian program, should Canadians own copyright? Should they control the exploitation and retain a portion of the program's value? Should a Canadian producer control the production? What about key creative positions? Should they be held by Canadians and how many positions should be held by Canadians? Should the cost of a program be spent on Canadians and in, on Canadian services? Uh, what about program subject matter? Should that be visibly Canadian? Should it smell Canadian? Should it quack like it's Canadian? Should independent producers play a special role? Um, and should underrepresented and equity seeking groups play a special role? And if so, how? Over to you, Doug. Um, now, so some of the questions that you saw on the previous page are already addressed in the current rules. And, um, but some of them raise brand new issues that have never been addressed before. So this sets the stage uh, for a debate. And the debate, frankly, has not started. Um, the focus has been so much on the big pictures of principle in Bill C-10 and now Bill C-11 and in the politics of marching it through the legislative process um, that this debate in our view has yet to start, but it will, um, it is going to get going and there, it is going to be um, a, 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 a hot topic for a good while. And there are likely to be public hearings at the CRTC in Ottawa specifically on this topic, and there will be many, many representations, and there will be an opportunity for the public to participate and for the student community and academic community to participate as, as well. And the results of this, as I've said earlier, will um, 
uh, have a big impact on the working life of uh, pretty much, much all the professionals in the industry. So let's start. Um, who or what is a Canadian? So we're talking about um, the, the definition of a Canadian program, but the, the first thing is who's a Canadian that would qualify to build the pyramid of the things that Canadians uh, are required to do. So the rule is a Canadian individual is a citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Um, and, um, and a permanent resident is somebody who's been admitted to Canada, but has not yet become a citizen. Um, a, a person in Canada temporarily on a visa of some kind does not qualify as a Canadian. Um, a Canadian corporation uh, is a, a taxable Canadian corporation based on the requirements of the Investment Canada Act. This is a big issue. There's been lots of law on it but essentially it is that the corporation has to be owned and controlled by Canadians. So those are the basic rules for a human person and for a corporate person. Now, it may surprise you to learn that there are at least three distinct paths to follow um, to be certified uh, as a um, Canadian program or film. And I, I, unless I make a distinction, I'm talking uh, indistinguishably between Canadian television shows and films, feature films. Uh, the main one, or the first one, um, is the Canadian Audiovisual Certification Office, which is part of the Department of Canadian Heritage. Now, CAVCO, we call it, um, runs a system based on rules that are in the Income Tax Act regulations. So that's two departments now involved in certifying. So what the Income Tax Act regulations say is that a film will be treated as Canadian um, once the minister has determined that it is Canadian within the set of rules that CAFCO administers. Um, why does the Income Tax Act matter in all of this? Um, and it has to do obviously with the tax credit systems, the two main tax credit systems, one for Canadian certified Canadian shows and one for production services shows. So we're going to unpack each of those as we go along. Separately, the CRTC runs its own certification system, which is not exactly the same. And it has traditionally been used because the CRTC's main job is to regulate Canadian broadcasters and broadcasters need to log all the programs that um, are treated as Canadian. And mostly the broadcasters were certifying shows that they um, produced in-house themselves. And so uh, the ownership of the show was not questioned and the CRTC made it easier for broadcasters to log their shows. So that's a second system, we're gonna go through that. A third system is operated by Telefilm Canada. Now Telefilm Canada, as you know, uh, is a subsidy, primarily a subsidy organization, but within its offices, um, is or the or the is the or is a body that certifies whether a project a production can be treated as a uh, treaty co-production. Now, over the years, Canada has entered into almost um, sixty co-production treaties with foreign countries. There is no co-production treaty with the United States, and there never will be. And one of the reasons. Uh, for that, of course, or the main reason is that all of the countries that have entered these treaties um, have similar issues in terms of uh, propose, uh, supporting domestic production, et cetera. So if you, have, uh, if you are certified as a treaty co-production, we'll go through what all that's about, um, you do qualify as Canadian content for the purposes of um, a logging as a, and your broadcast logs and so on. Now, um, what's interesting about all this is that not everybody does the same thing. So the CAVCO system is primarily um, to uh, assess whether um, Canadian content productions and treaty co-productions are eligible for the Canadian content tax credits. A certification from the CRTC does not make you eligible for a 
Canadian content tax credit. The CRTC has no connection with those income tax regulations, but the CRTC accepts all the CAVCO certifications for its purposes. Um, shows that are not, that the CRTC certifies as Canadian though, uh, can access the production services tax credit. They just can't claim that they are certified as Canadian for tax credit purposes. Now, we're gonna spend a bit of time here talking about how the tax credit system works. Um, the federal government has a tax credit system and it's, uh, you get essentially 25% of qualified labor expenditures. And we'll explain how it comes to you in a minute. Uh, in many provinces, not all, there are additionally provincial tax credits that stack on top of the federal tax credit. So the provincial tax credits would obviously qualify as a percentage of the uh, eligible expenditures within the province. The reason it focuses on labor is that um, uh, it's easy to track. Um, they have a system where T4 slips are issued for labor costs, and therefore the government is able to see that the uh, T4 slips are properly issued and can tax the recipients who earn the money and so on. And I'd say that um, there is almost no resistance politically. I, I, I don't want to say none whatsoever, but there's almost no resistance po politically to the value of these tax credits, not because they're a subsidy drain, but because I think the governments understand they kind of make money on them. So the, the, the way it works is that all of the economic activity that is generated from film and television production drives taxable income. And not only in the hands of individuals, but in the hands of the hotels and restaurants and catering companies and so on. So um, uh, I, I actually think that these governments, they do track how much they um, um, spend on the tax credits, but I think they also track how much they make. And it's either break even or they do make some money. And one of the interesting things is governments don't pay out the tax credits until well after production is completed, but they get all the tax income as the production is ongoing because you pay taxes, of course, on, you know, on a regular basis, particularly for labor. Let's move on. So the way tax credits work is that um, when a production is complete, you drop in a year end, uh, at the after the last production expenditures have been incurred. So now you have a fiscal year or maybe two fiscal years during which uh, the entire costs of the production, which are always audited, uh, are contained. And because the, the project, the television show has never uh, been exploited, there's no income to offset. It's just an expense uh, story. Um, the primary way that this is done is that every single production has its own company incorporated to put the production in. You don't actually have your regular, ordinary day-to-day -day company carry out the production. The risks are too high. You incorporate a new company and then that company becomes, for both the risk purposes and in terms of copyright infringement and all that kind of stuff, and for tax purposes, a separate entity. Now, what makes the tax credit special, and it's unique to this activity, is that they are called refundable. And what that means for, for, for the vast majority of taxpayers, um, uh, you credit you, any tax credits you have against any taxes that you have to pay. But in the case of tax credits, production, film and television production tax credits, um, there is no tax to pay, so you just have the credits sitting there in your tax return. And that credit is payable to you. The government gives you a check for the full amount of the credit all at once and actually pays it out to you in cash. So since that check obviously arrives considerably after the completion of production, sometimes 18, as much as 18 months, um, the question is how does the producer then finance particularly smaller Canadian producers, finance the cost of the production on an ongoing basis? And the answer is that the uh, paper that the 
that the government, the, the tax return that you have that shows the, the amount of the tax credit on it, you can take to a bank and borrow that money or almost that amount of money, there's a slight discount. And for 25 years or more, there has been a highly competitive market among Canadian banks to lend money to Canadian productions and the only security they take are, is, well, there's a few other things, but there's the primary security they take is the promise to pay uh, by the Canadian government, the tax credit that is pre-calculated before production starts. And the system on the face of it looks like it would be highly risky and it, it, it doesn't look like it would be a well-oiled machine, but it is. Um, virtually all of the production costs for all of the television productions made in Canada are advanced by one of the larger banks against this security that I've mentioned. And then what happens is that when the tax credit becomes actually payable, the producer has signed a, um, by the federal government or the provincial governments, um, the producer has signed uh, what's called an acknowledgement and direction, a document, lawyers, fight over them, uh, that instructs the Revenue Canada, or Canada Revenue Agency, to pay the money to the bank, not to the producer. So even though the producer is the one who the money is owed to, the money is paid to the bank, and that payment then uh, cancels out the debt. And of course, interest is calculated in and so on. So uh, th that's the way the Canadian, the financial way that the Canadian film and television production industry works. and. Um, it's highly complex, um, but in the 25 or 30 years that I've been familiar with it, I'm only aware of, of, of a single claim that occurred, um, and it did occur while I was chair of the Canadian Television Fund, a single claim that has occurred where this system of assigning the tax credits and so on hasn't actually worked. So um, I think, Aaron, this is still me. Okay, um, let's now look at the CAVCO certification. I said there were three, let's start with CAVCO. There are four pillars. Um, the first one has to do with the control of the production. Uh, the second has to do with copyright and distribution rights. The third has to do with creative positions and the fourth has to do with production spend. So we're gonna break those pillars down. I'm gonna start with production control. So for the CAVCO um, tax credits, to, in order to be certified as a domestic Canadian production, everyone receiving a producer credit must be Canadian. Producer must be central decision maker from development to exploitation. Um, so the producer needs to hold final decision making power over creative and financial aspects of the production. And just as a side note, there are some really fun technical, complex technical exceptions for certain producer functions. Um, again, throwing these, these questions out at you, which we will not answer, but perhaps you will, think about the production control pillar and what policy goal or goals this pillar is trying to support, cultural industrial economic competition. Is production control still relevant in an glo increasingly globalized world? Um, does it work? Has it ever worked? Does it work now? Is it accomplishing those policy goals that it is set out to do? Second pillar is copyright and distribution rights. And I'm going to break that down even more. Um, so unless we're talking about treaty co-productions, and Doug will touch on this uh, for a minute a little bit later, <laughs> but only the Canadian production company can be a copyright owner for all commercial exploitation purposes for the 25 year period from when the production is completed. And CAVCO uh, verifies this by reviewing um, chain of title documents, financing, exploitation documents, things like that. There have been over the years some interesting uh, workarounds or workthroughs or loopholes in this uh, in this provision, but the rule is Canadian production company copyright owner for all commercial exploitation purposes for 25 years. And then the second part of this pillar, um, the distribution side, is that the production company or a prescribed person, production company must control the initial licensing, 
of the exploitation for the 25 year period. And there must be an agreement in writing with either a Canadian distributor or a CRTC licensed broadcaster. So I think we're going to see, um, well, again, these are CAVCO rules, not CRTC rules, but this is certainly an area that the CRTC will want to dig into in terms of when it's defining what a Canadian program is, do these things, um, does the CRTC need to include something like this in its definition, um, and are these working, do they still make sense? Again, same questions, right? What policy goal or goals is the copyright and distribution rights pillar trying to support? Is it still relevant today? And does it work? Back to Doug. Now, um, the, the things that um, Aaron has talked about are all focused on a kind of corporate authority uh, over the production. Now we get to who's actually working on it. And the commission has developed a, a system over the years of, of the, it's called the 10 point system. Can I, we move on to the next slide? And um, the, the rule is that there's an allocation of 10 points. And the rule is that a Canadian production must uh, achieve six out of the 10 points, not 10 out of the 10. There's some exceptions, we'll get to that. So the writer gets two points, the director gets two points and either the writer or the director must be Canadian. So you need one of those two. Um, the highest paid performer gets a point. The second highest paid gets a point. You need one of those two. So maybe you're beginning to see how the labor side of it works, which is that you can have a Canadian production without a Canadian writer and without a star. And that is expressly part of the system. Um, and then for live action productions, um, four points go to the director of photography, the art director, the music composer, and the picture editor. And if you look at those functions, you can see that they are key creative and craft positions. But if you get those four points, you only need another two to get to the magic six threshold. Uh, and again, uh, this scheme or this de device, is it working uh, and is it relevant? And by the way, I would say this is very controversial. Um, let's go to the next slide. You'll explain why. Um, so, so it's controversial for a couple of reasons. One is because in the early days when particularly American cable systems uh, started uh, popping up, they loved doing business with Canada because it was fairly easy to have a television series when you had um, a, an American writer, an American star, and you did the production in Canada. This is how our locations business uh, grew, and particularly in the early days. And it's, I think, a key reason why uh, Vancouver has such a stale, stellar um, crew infrastructure and studio infrastructure and so on. Um, and so what happens now, though, is that um, a, a lot of the sources of subsidy, of, of actual subsidy, like uh, the Canada Media Fund, say, we know that you can get a show certified for a six out of 10, but we're not prepared to support such shows. We will only support the show if it's 10 out of 10. So writer, director, and all of the, the key leads have to be Canadian. Um, and uh, the, the reason this is a key moment is because as the streamers are asked to make contributions to Canadian programming, will they be asked to meet the minimum requirements of the, um, uh, of, the reg, reg, of the certification system, or will they be asked to meet the higher standards of the subsidy? Now, of course, if they want to do business with a Canadian producer and that Canadian producer wants to access, um, say, the Canada Media Fund, then, of course, the show would have to be, as we call it, 10 out of 10. Um, but this discussion will be very, very important uh, in deciding how things will go on that front. Um, the other uh, thing that has uh, always been in place is that 75% of the 
production costs for services uh, must be payable to Canadians and 75% of the total cost for post-production services as well. This has been a very important driver for the uh, uh, ability of Canada to make high quality productions. Um, it's very interesting. If you're looking at making, and American studios are always doing this, if you're looking at making a, a major production in a, a remote place, not just Canada, but anywhere in the world, the question they always ask themselves is, do they have a crew? You know, do they have a crew that can make a, a high quality first class prime time type of production? Or do they have to, um, do we have to send everybody there? And of course, the cost of hiring with American dollars and then sending them all over for weeks at a time is very expensive. It kind of undercuts the savings they might gain from producing in that country. So, um, uh, and then of course, the question is, do you have two crews or three crews or four crews? And in a number of Canadian cities now, there are, there's not only high quality studios, uh, but there are multiple uh, unlimited amounts of very high quality uh, talent in the in the technical side of things who are who are able to produce um, uh, uh, high quality production. I, I saw a piece in today that um, Netflix has renewed a studio relationship with uh, a Vancouver based studio facility for five years. And they're taking essentially half of all the studios they have available. So they're renting studios for productions that they haven't even thought of yet. And so they're booking them so they will be available. And the, what that means is that they have confidence that everything that goes into a production can be delivered to a Netflix standard. These are shows that Netflix presumably is gonna produce on its own in any event. We don't know whether they're Canadian content or not. And again, we ask the same question, um, uh, what policy goal is the production spin pillar trying to support? And is it, is it so relevant, does it work? And uh, the point I want to make is yes, it's economic in the sense that it drives uh, investment and uh, businesses and so on. But the other thing is that it makes talent permanently available. It holds the talent together. So I'm going to start with path two to defining what a Canadian program is, or at least to certification. And Doug and I have had a very healthy debate over the last couple of weeks about <laughs> the importance of certification at the CRTC. And I think where we've gotten to is that we're, we're thinking about these things from, from two different angles, which is a good thing, right? Healthy debate is a good thing. Um, Doug touched on this earlier in the presentation, but Certification by the CRTC is certainly a way or the way for Canadian broadcasters to log their Canadian content um, obligations. So um, as an example, Canadian licensed broadcasters currently have obligations to spend a certain amount of their revenues on Canadian programming, on programs of national interest and on independent productions and a number of other things. So. If, if they're not accessing CAVCO, um, and sometimes even if they are, uh, they will log their programs with the CRTC. And sometimes you hear about it, they're, they're issued a C number. Um, there's some other letters as well. There's a dubbing number and something else, but a C number is the main one. And um, so CRTC certification is primarily used today to log these obligations, giving the broadcasters a tick mark um, to demonstrate that they're meeting the, the regulatory obligations they have to the CRTC. This uh, certification may be expanded as we look forward when we start thinking about obligations of streamers that are coming in and foreign streamers that are coming in. And I think it may start playing a significantly more important role, um, particularly if BDU-like obligations are placed on streamers. So let me... Um, I will get there in a minute. I'm going to keep going on the certification. So the CRTC certification is more lax than CAVCO. Um, and as Doug mentioned, it doesn't qualify a production for Canadian content tax credits. They do, they do qualify for the production services tax credit. Um, and there are similar tax credits in many provinces. So we've already touched on that. 
And uh, remember that a CAVCO certification does meet the CRTC obligations. CAVCO is, is um, stricter. And if you meet CAVCO certification, you will also meet the CRTC definition. But the inverse is not true. I think I said that right. Um, here's why I think the CRTC certification could become more important, or at least as important as I think it is today, and Doug doesn't think it is today. <laughs> so the broad, our broadcasting policy, section 31E of the Broadcasting Act, states that each element of the system shall contribute in an appropriate manner to the creation and presentation of Canadian programming. And there's a number of other um, broad policy statements in the act that say similar things. Um, and in the online streaming act, there's quite a few more that talk about um, the contributions that um, broadcasting undertakings, including online undertakings need to make to the Canadian system and to Canadian programming. So when I look at this, I look at the words Canadian programming. Currently, we've talked a bit about broadcaster obligations, but also BDUs, broadcast distribution undertakings, which are cable and satellite companies. Right now, they contribute roughly 5% of their gross revenues from their broadcasting activities to, quote, Canadian programming. And currently, 80% of that money goes to the Canada Media Fund, and the remainder goes to certified independent production funds. This is a huge chunk of money that funds the production of Canadian programming in this country. So right now, we're roughly $200 million a year goes to Canada Media Fund. It's on the decline because broadcaster or BDU revenues, excuse me, BDU revenues are on the decline because of cord cutting as people shift away from their cable subscriptions to um, online services. The revenues of the BDUs are dropping, which means that 5% of dropping revenues is dropping as well. So CMF funding is on the decline. Um, <clears throat> CMF is also funded by a uh, contribution from Canadian Heritage, um, which somewhere 150 million ish, something like that. So CMF is a huge um, funder here. And the reason I'm focusing in on this is if we start talking about online streamers, or online, um, online undertakings, the way they're defined in the online Services Act. Um, if we start thinking about them contributing to Canadian programming the way a BDU currently does by giving us some cash to be crude about it, um, that obligation will say something like, Amazon, you must contribute 5% of your previous year's gross revenues derived from subscriptions in Canada to quote Canadian programming. So then I say, what is Canadian programming? So the money will then be directed to however the CRTC decides to define Canadian programming. So if it's um, six out of 10 creative points, does copyright need to be owned by Canadians, et cetera, et cetera. That is where, where the CRTC is going to decide where this money goes. From there, if it goes to CMF, CMF will, will develop its own rules or maybe keep the same rules it has in place today, but it will layer on top of or beside the CRTC's definition of Canadian programming. It has to. The CRTC is the one putting the regulatory obligations on the online undertakings, and then it will direct the money to CMF, Certified Independent, excuse me, Certified Independent Production Funds, the SIPs. Um, or some other fund or something else entirely. So I think the certification at the CRTC is uh, significantly more important than Doug thinks it is, or it's at least as important as I think it is today. The reason there's a slight difference in perspective, I may have convinced Doug, if not earlier, maybe tonight, um, is I'm thinking about the money coming into the system and he's thinking about how we access the money once it's there. I'm speaking for you now, Doug, I hope you don't mind. So the CRTC definition of Canadian program today, producer must be Canadian, central decision maker from development to commercial exploitation, sounds familiar. Six of 10 points, sounds familiar. 
75 production, 75 percent production costs paid to Canadians, post production lab costs provided in Canada, and certified under an eligible program um, category. So thinking about those four pillars on the CAVCO side, production control, creative points, production spend, noticeably absent from the CRTC's current definition is uh, copyright, ownership of the copyright and distribution. So that's a question mark. What is the CRTC going to do with that? We have theories as to why it's not there now. Remember, it's a closed Canadian only system. So do we need to talk about Canadian ownership of the copyright in a program when everyone who's using the CRTC definition is Canadian? Maybe that's why it's missing, but this is gonna be a question mark as we move forward. So um, you're beginning to understand why this is a deeply complicated um, question. And um, uh, the, the, the current act, has this question in it, which it wants the CRTC to determine whether a program should further Canadian artistic and cultural expression. And of course, I, I'm not sure I understand what that means um, and how a program might do that. Of course, arguably you might do it through the um, use of Canadian uh, uh, folks as a director, writer, and, lead performers and so on, but maybe it means something else. We don't know what it means. Let's skip along. And then there's this other question that has come up. Um, and we don't ask that any of the, we just ask that folks, you know, if you're if director, writer, we just ask that they be Canadian. We don't put any other um, metric on whether uh, something should be done with respect to underrepresented or sovereignty seeking communities and so on. Brand new question. Next. So um, I see the time and I'm going to just do this quickly. The third pillar uh, has to do with the co-productions that I mentioned. Um, and the way these co-productions work is that they look at the amount of resources that come from uh, each of the two countries, and they essentially divide up the, um, the production according to the, the money in. So, and, and most uh, treaties say that a minimum of X percent, it usually 20 or 30 percent has to come from one country. Um, and um, so money in creates whether it's a 70-30 co-production, and then money out is supposed to effectively match. So the amount of if it's a 70-30 Canada-France co-production, 70% um, and 70% of the money comes from Canada, then 70% of the project should uh, be a, a Canadian, Canadian performers, Canadian, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, the, once the two countries, each of these countries have a certification office, once the two countries have signed off, on the treaty on the project as a treaty co-production, it then gets full national treatment in each country, which means it's treated as domestic for the purposes of both countries. And um, uh, and in Canada, uh, the co-production co co certification is effectively administered up top on a day-to-day -day basis by Telefilm, but that recommendation then goes to CAVCO. And so the treaty co-productions are entitled to receive tax credits on the Canadian side of the spend. Now, I think I've covered off most of the points in the following slide as well. Yeah, uh, I think I've, so we'll just skip past this one. So um, in all of this that we've told you, very dense pile of information, there isn't a single requirement anywhere that the Canadian programs are actually Canadian in the sense of the story. Um, there are uh, rules about if you, you know, buy an underlying property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you certainly can make, easily make a, a, a Canadian program, um, a certified Canadian program with no evidence whatsoever that it is uh, Canadian at all. Even a 10 out of 10 Canadian 
program if you follow all of the requirements. There's no incremental or additional requirement that the program be visibly Canadian. And of course, there's been much humor around this about, you know, having a cutaway of the CN Tower and so on. Uh, but on a very serious note, um, the, the fact that, and, and people, some people would applaud, well, many people would applaud this and say that it enables us to tell global stories that are not fixed in a setting and that the setting itself does not uh, drive or um, impact the story. Now the UK approach is completely different. They have a 35 point system. You have to get a majority of points in order to have um, certification for their purposes. Um, and the, they're all the, the points you have, mandatory points you have to get um, are all about uh, the setting and the story and the proportion of the story which is visibly set in the UK. So you a show like The Crown, which is incredibly uh, uh, specific to the um, uh, British experience, uh, is essentially a, a totally owned global rights Netflix production. And, um, and I guess uh, the question is, is that good or bad? Does it matter anymore? Now there's a completely different take in Europe, history is much deeper and older and richer and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but nonetheless, um, their system is doesn't focus on distribution, production, copyright ownership or anything like that. Can I give an example of almost the flip of what we're saying here? So here we're saying um, no requirement that Canadian programs tell a Canadian story. And there's a lot of certified programs that have no Canadian setting. On the flip side, there are also a lot of programs that have a Canadian setting that aren't Canadian certified, CanCon certified. So Scott Pilgrim versus the world. There was a reason we included Michael Sarah, Sarah's picture earlier in the, um, in the deck. So Canadian author of a graphic novel, Canadian star, Michael Sarah, um, Toronto's the backdrop backdrop not sure it's a Canadian story necessarily music was by Beck but also by metric um, American and British producers was in CanCon and for a more recent example what about turning red I haven't seen it so I'm going to pretend like I know what it's about but we have a Canadian writer animator director Toronto backdrop that is apparently heavily featured but Pixar is the producer so presumably not Canadian, uh, not eligible for CanCon tax credits, um, but it is that one arguably is telling a Canadian story. So to Doug's point, good or bad, does any of it matter anymore? Do we need these things to be regulated? Are our stories getting out there already? Or uh, what does this look like going forward? So uh, where do we go from here? Um, and this is where the story for folks like Peter Rand and myself becomes very interesting because as Aaron has pointed out, it's definitely a policy debate. Um, it's definitely a parliamentary legislative story. And then of course it goes down the street to the CRTC where it becomes a regulatory story. And the CRTC is an administrative tribunal. It is by law independent of the government, it is supposed to operate independently. There are provisions in the act which give the government the ability to send the CRTC uh, policy directions and it will do that. But subject to the policy directions um, that the CRTC will send, um, uh, the CRTC has a remarkable breadth of discretion uh, on how all of this stuff will unfold. Um, and there is almost nothing in the bill that is sufficiently specific to hang a hat on. So everything that is discretionary and has the, having to do with the implementation of this new policy will come at the CRTC. The CRTC has about is, has up to 13 commissioners. Um, interestingly enough, apart from the current chair, every single one of the commissioners is a woman. Uh, the current chair's term of office expires on September the 4th. And so it looks as though the new process of the process that will unfold after the bill uh, 
its past um, will involve a new leadership. And that leadership is unidentified and nobody that I've spoken to knows who it might be. Um, so here's what we're going to do about this. We see this as an unfolding, a live event. Um, and we'd like to see DMX and the folks who are committed and involved in DMX participate in it. So we, we are going to, once we hear the bill is passed and we see there's a direction and we get a sense of the uh, CRTC timetable, and we do know a lot of these folks, um, we're going to do our best to hold a series of events um, that unpacks the, what the CRTC is trying to do and so on. And hopefully uh, give groups of students, if they wish, an opportunity to directly participate in the event. It's a public process. The CRTC has a long encouraged public participation. Um, a student of mine once wrote a major paper and I said, send it into the CRTC. They took it and they invited him up to appear in person um, at the hearing. And so the, the, uh, the idea that uh, you can have an impact on what is done at the CRTC is not far-fetched at all. And we're, we at DMX draw are going to track um, the timetable so that, and, and send out notices and hold events to backstop uh, any work you might want to do to directly participate. And so we go back now, finally, to the questions that you saw. It's the same slide that you saw earlier. These are the questions that hang over the process. Um, and you can see now that not only are there different Canadian approaches to them from the CAVCO and the CRTC, but there's different approaches between Canada and other countries. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want to say that this is totally open. Um, I think some, you know, version of the status quo plus will occur, um, but the, these are dynamic and important questions for us to ponder. And I think that's it for me and Aaron. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you both so, so much. So now we have a few minutes to take some student questions. So I can see already we have a few that have been posted in the chat. So I'll go ahead and start asking those to you, Doug and, and Aaron. But um, of course, if anyone has any questions that they would like to drop, you know, as we're thinking, as we're talking right now, please feel free to do so. It's the time uh, to ask these pressing questions. So our first question is concerning tax credit. So as the tax credit can only be received after the production is completed, if a production ran out of funds and could not be completed, would that tax credit never be redeemable? Um, a great, great question. Um, yes, one of the imperatives uh, about film and television production is once you start, you can't stop. There's no half a film. So if, um, uh, and the fact that there has been, this has almost never happened or may have, actually, I think I do know of one time where it happened, but if production comes to a stop, everything collapses. And I certainly don't think the tax credit is payable on monies that haven't been spent if the thing is, um, um, so here, Marcia is answering the questions. <laughs> um, yeah. I think you have to have a finished production in order to yeah. get the next credit for sure. Yeah, the I've never seen that happen. I have seen um, folks think they're eligible for the tax credit and that be questioned. Not anyone we've given advice to, but um, I have seen that happen. Um, and yeah, things things get ugly if you don't get the tax credits that you were expecting to get. Great. Um, so our next questions, I believe, was sort of answered already, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyway. So here we have a question concerning um, whether like a producer can or cannot be a permanent resident. Um, 
Well, if they, they qualify as Canadian if they're permanent resident. Uh, they call and residency has certain requirements that you have to maintain. Once you're a Canadian citizen, you can live anywhere. So this is one of the reasons that so many Canadians end up in Hollywood. And then of course they qualify as Canadian on the productions they get to work on. Uh, Carolyn, I have a question for Aaron and Doug. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my question has to do with, uh, you mentioned that uh, production companies, um, you know, Canadian production companies uh, to get the funding, there was this whole thing about they have to uh, license to a broadcaster, Canadian broadcaster or Canadian um, licensed distributor, right? How do you get on the, C not Canadian, CRTC license, how do you get to be on that? Because presumably we're going to have a lot of like the streamers try to get on that list. So how does that happen? On the, the broadcaster list? Like not the, like on the, how do you get to, not the broadcaster list, the distributor, the distributor. Canadian distributor list. You lobby hard. <laughs> I'm not joking. You lobby hard. Perfect. So, so basically they're not the, at this, the way it's set up right now, they're not going to be Canadian broadcasters or distributors unless they become Canadian companies. Great question. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. There are some, um, there are some considered Canadian distributors that, that you, we might put a question mark beside it, but there are there are reasons that they're on the list so they can trigger the tax credits. Doug, are you thinking of an answer or should I ask the ne next question in the chat? No, I think I'm looking at the time and thinking, um, I, th I think Erin did just fine with that. All right. She, um, she said up front, there are a lot of questions for which we don't have answers. <laughs> Fair enough. So I think we can move forward to the second portion of today's presentation. Thank you so much to our speakers today, uh, Doug Barrett and Aaron Finley. And thank you to everyone who uh, showed up and engaged in the conversations that came afterwards. And uh, thank you to those of you who are watching this um, after the fact. Uh, please join us for uh, future videos and engage in these questions in the comments. Thank you. <laughs>